Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And uh, it is Tuesday, February 16th. And we are considering continuing our discussions on H87, which is an act relating to establishing a classification system for criminal offenses. Um, during our discussions, the issue of um, restitution and when restitution is paid and, and how that works um, has come up a number of times in terms of considering um, the sentencing uh, commission's uh, recommendations and, and H87. So uh, I've asked um, Chris Fenno from the Center for Crime Victim Services to uh, to come and testify and explain to us how um, how the program works. And thank you, Chris, so much for your for your patience. I, I think we had to cancel you one day and, and you've been waiting a long time already. So anyway, thank you. And I know that Robin Joy is also here to, to chime in. So good afternoon and welcome. Um, for the record, this is Chris Fenno. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. And um, I, I just wanna preface my remarks by saying, I think that issue that the impact that this kind of a bill and reorganizing fees and fines has on victim services in the state will make an impact. But this is what we're talking about in lots of different places. We saw and we have seen continuing declines in, those, in that revenue. And um, Vermont really funds victim services a lot through special funds and through these funds. So that said, um, when I came to the center four years ago, I had never really um, worked around and under, didn't really understand restitution. And, um, and I think people often get restitution and compensation confused. So I'm gonna start with the easy one, which is compensation. <laughs> um, and the compensation program here, uh, gives financial assistance up to $10,000, and there is a cap on that, um, for crime victims in Vermont who have uninsured crime-related expenses arising from a violent crime. And this program is run in, con in, in conjunction with the federal government who reimburses the state 60 cents for every dollar that we spend. So we get revenue from it and then we give that out. The, the important thing about victims' compensation is that it's not to um, fix anything that might have gone wrong in the commission of the crime unless it is physical, it, unless it, it somehow affects the victim. So if they need mental health counseling, they need a broken leg fixed. Um, but victims' compensation is also the payer of last resort. So if they have insurance, the insurance is gonna pay. If they have a copay attached to that or a deductible, then victim's compensation can pay that. But all of our payments are to providers. They're not, it, it's about things that have happened um, to an individual or to a family. But what we do is we pay providers who, uh, on, on their behalf. One thing that um, has greatly increased in my time here with compensation, and I and and maybe Robin knows the answer to this. I don't know, but um, <laughs> we have we pay out a lot uh, for homicide victims' families, and um, it has became it has become quite pricey because a lot of times they they're out of state. We had to bring somebody in from Alaska, um, and so. I mean, they, they, there's still the $10,000 cap, but when there's a homicide, any of a, of a, a group of, of qualified family members can get $10,000 each. So we may have five ma family members that need to come in and they each could do up to $10,000. Um, there are limits placed on travel. There are limits placed on funeral costs, crime scene cleanup and those kinds of things. But, um, but it's victim compensation is really about having this benefit um, folks of violent crimes who have things that they need to have physically done. So if they get, uh, 
robbed, if they get their tires slashed, if they get their door broken down, um, these funds can't be used for any of that. At the center, we have four and a half staff positions that work in this program. Um, four full-time people, the half-time person runs our sexual assault program. Um, the other thing that's important about this is that there has to be probable cause established. So we actually, if it's not reported to law enforcement, that, and this is a federal regulation, then we can't assist um, because there really does need to be probable cause that it's a crime related injury or loss. Um, so that, that's the easy one. <laughs> and, and maybe restitution is easy too, I don't know. But um, restitution is really about uh, the courts who order restitution on sentencing. And they order it based on loss. So I, I got my door broken in down and it's gonna cost $300 to fix it. The, the judge can order $300 in restitution to be paid. Um, uh, there are, you know, I got robbed and I lost my paycheck that I just cashed and there was $500. Um, they could order $500 restitution at, at um, sentencing. The judgment has to be issued for, by the court and um, there are only certain uh, well, let me go back one second. There's two kinds of victims that get served through restitution, individuals and businesses or, or companies. So we help both of those groups. Um, we, uh, our restitution unit manages all of the restitution for crimes in the state and it's collected for all crime types. So with businesses, it could be a state agency, a commercial business, stores, banks, that kind. And then there's the individuals who are crime victims. If you're an individual and a crime victim, oftentimes the restitution ordered is under $5,000. And if there are qualifying items that need to be replaced, uh, we don't we don't replace money, but we do replace things like uh, he stole my phone, and you know you need a new cell phone. Um, so as long as we can get a, a cost associated with that, um, we through the center will upfront the restitution to individual crime victims up to five thousand dollars. And at that point, then the victim is done and it goes to our collectors who then work to get that restitution paid back into our fund. We don't do it for businesses, um, but we do do it for individuals. We have the ability like collectors of um, child support, um, for instance, we have the ability and the power to attach wages, to take lottery winnings, to take um, uh, cash that they've forgotten that they have that is held by the state. So we, we actually do all of that. We also have the ability to place liens on property and we work should the, the perpetrator die and there's an estate, we will work with that estate to recoup um, the restitution or to get the restitution for a business. Um, we have six staff that work pursuing unpaid balances. And uh, each one has about 700 cases that they're working on at any given time. Um, they reach people by phone, they make payment arrangements. Um, we have people who on you know the same day every month, we run a credit card for them because they can pay $20 a month on that credit card. Uh, we also have a victim uh, liaison and supervisor, and that's to work with victims so that they understand what we can reimburse them up front. They get all their restitution ultimately, but if it's over $5,000, they don't get it. Or if it's 
money or jewelry. They don't get that part back until the offender pays us. Um, right now, we have 9,924 active accounts um, for 4,922 offenders. Under law, we can seek any monies owed to the state by the offender. Um, and so that is exactly what we, we take as our mission uh, for the restitution unit. We have, uh, we, we certainly give prior notice around tax returns and all of that. We have to follow, there's lots of rules and regulations that we have to follow so that people know that we're taking their money. Um, but it, it is a way that people can, can get reimbursed at sentencing. Now at sentencing, they do take, my understanding is that they do take into account ability to pay back the funds. Um, we have people, especially if they leave the state, we're unable to, to find them. Um, they do a lot of skip tracing, the collectors do. Uh, but if somebody moves out of state, it's really pretty impossible to do collections. Um, Sometimes we get repaid when somebody applies for a job. We had somebody who applied for a federal job and they were gonna do a background check. So he sent us a check for $12,000 to pay off his restitution so that that wasn't on his record anymore. So oftentimes it's done like that. If we have a lien against a property and they wanna refinance, they'll pay us back, we'll, they'll pay us then. Um, but many, I mean, many people who are paying restitution don't have a lot of money. And so we really try to work out what is going to work for them. It's, you know, we're, we're not like those credit card agencies who, who hound people. Um, we really, we don't hound people. We make up plans. If they don't stick to the plans, we'll try to reach out. Um, but uh, it is kind of, um, the wild west is how I feel when they're all over there working because they all have headsets, they have automatic dialers, they, you know, the whole thing. The interesting part, which I wanna bring back to the center um, is that this ultimately is a victim service because for anybody who has been, who has gotten an award under $5,000, they can be done with what has happened to them. And it is an important thing because if they had to negotiate themselves, go back to court because you know they're not getting paid for whatever. Um, and this happens a lot in uh, domestic violence cases. Uh, the truth is they don't ever have to deal with that person again, we get to. So, um, so it really is a victim service that we offer and uh, it, it does pay for itself through the victims uh, restitution special fund. So that's the easiest way I know how to explain those two things, but certainly questions. Um. Great, thank you very much. And um, I'm actually gonna um, ask Representative um, Norris, cause Bob, I know you had you had questions. Um, so I wanna make sure that you, um, that you have a better understanding now. I do have questions, yes, thank you. Thank Great. You. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I'm not going to try to take up all of your time here because other folks may have questions also. So it's my understanding that uh, you're, you are funded through the state of Vermont? We're a, a small state agency. A small state agency funded yep. through? Pardon? How are you funded again? Well, we, we, <clears throat> these are just two of the things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, we also have a grants program that we administer a lot of federal money for uh, victim services, um, probably about $6 million or $7 million a year that we, we grant out to um, nonprofit and other kinds of uh, organizations to do victim services. And then we support the victim advocate program, which is having an advocate in each of the state's attorney's office. Um, so, so it's through all of the, it's through all of that on the federal funds, 
on the federal funds, we are, um, we're allowed to take about anywhere between five and 10% of the, of the money and pass through the rest. So that covers part of our administration. And then we also pay um, the, out of the restitution fund, the cost of the restitution unit under the compensation fund, the cost of the, the workers under that, and then part of our administration. We don't get any state general fund to support the center. Okay, so uh, so you have your compensation fund and you have your restitution fund. Is the we do, and we, all, and we, we also administer one other fund, which is the Domestic Violence Sexual Assault Fund, and 100% of it is passed through to the network programs. I, I think it's great, <clears throat> but it appears as though that when restitution is ordered that you simply front the money for victims? Yes. And then attempt to, so on a, a six month basis, on a yearly basis or whatever, what does your accounts receivable look like as far as recouping these monies that are ordered through the courts? Okay, I have, I do have um, an amount. Um, last year, in, in, in 20, FY20, uh, a total of not quite a million dollars, 987, thousand six hundred and forty eight dollars was ordered in restitution we advanced about a two hundred and fifty seven thousand um, dollars to victims and by actually yesterday um, we had collected fifty two thousand dollars of that wow so that's not good well it's not but our our restitution fund is pretty robust because it, it um, is fines and, and people who get sentenced through the criminal process. Right, but, but part of the restitution is, is uh, for the lack of a better term, uh, a sentence handed down from the court to an individual that says, you must pay this. And, and as it turns out, probably two out of 10 do, it would appear. You're looking at $50,000 oh. on the cost receivable. It, they actually do pay it. Then it may take a while. I'm sorry. So why are your accounts receivable so high, Chris? Because we're dealing with a population that doesn't have a lot of disposable income. So the, the judge has taken that into account when they ordered it. Mm. Um, and then we take that into account as we're trying to collect it. So it, it truly might be $10 a month. And they may owe, you know, $7,000. It takes a long time. Okay, I'll I'll ask one more question then in case someone else has a bunch of questions here. So over the course of a year or two years, or whatever else, what do you actually write off as far as we're not going to get this? We don't. We don't write it off until they die. So it could be just forever until until they pass. 20 away. years. Yeah. Every every month we actually have a, a report given to the board. Um, and, and it, say, it states how many offenders have died and, and if we're writing anything off then. Now, sometimes, especially if it's a large amount that has been ordered um, and somebody dies, we will make uh, an arrangement for, to take less. So, you know, we, we, are, we do have some flexibility too. All right, so I, I know I said that was my last question, but this will be my last question. <laughs> so in the terms of, does everybody pay? Most people pay. People who leave the state, we have a hard time collecting from until they move back to the state. Okay, so, so those are the monies that I'm concerned about. Those monies are left in a limbo, shall we say. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what I was trying to get a figure on that. I don't know what that is because we just, we always try to, to get payment. Even if they leave the state, we'll try tracking them out of state. Um, but it's very difficult. Okay. I think it's great for the victim. So I think this is a great program for the victim. So on, so forth. I just want to make sure that the other end is, is living up to their responsibility, so to speak. Yeah. Yes. And the, the thing with it is that at one point, um, we also were fronting up to $5,000. Actually, I think it was 10,000 then, up to $10,000 for businesses too, but it became um, too costly for us. 
because a lot of the businesses were big businesses. We, what we really wanted was the mom and pop stores, um, that, that kind of restitution that got ordered, but uh, we couldn't do that. We had to say, okay, we're only gonna do individuals because if we said we were gonna do some, kind, some types of businesses, then the banks and the grocery stores and everybody else could come in and demand that we give them that money too upfront. But I, my experience is it's the small businesses. Whenever we do public events where we're looking for feedback, um, those are the people who come and tell stories that, you know, how much it hurt their small business. And I believe it. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll let somebody else chime in here. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, because we just have very few um, minutes left. I do want to adjourn on time. So uh, Barbara and then Martin. Okay. Hi, Chris. Sorry, I missed the Hi. beginning. Um, so I, I want to, and you're presenting, I know, Thursday, right? In Yes. I will be there, so that's good. But um, you said a few minutes ago that you're a state agency, and I would say you're not state employees. We're not. So you're not a typical state agency that gets funded like a state agency, and I think it's just important we kind of set that stage. You're not like the Defender General's office or the, so when you're doing your budget, you need new software, your, a bit, your bill scope. How are you funding your general operating expenses? A lot of it is from this 5% on the federal funds and our special funds. And you're right, we, we are not state employees. Um, when the center was tasked with victims' compensation, and the legislation shows this. It's in statute that we couldn't be state employees. Uh, so we are not state employees. However, because we're a state agency, we work with, um, we, we just recently, because of COVID, uh, needed people, all of our staff, when COVID hit, we had to lay off a lot of people. We had to furlough them because they couldn't work from home. So we just got a, a virtual private network through the state um, and upgraded our speed. And so all of that goes through the state. Um, but we, you are correct. We are not state agents. We are not state employees. And your subcontracted victim advocates are state employees now, right? They are. Well, they are, I think. Not yours, they are state, they're, they receive those, right, okay. Yeah, um, yep, they do. So it's interesting because again, I think you're the best deal in town. I don't know anyone that charges 5% admin. I mean, so in a way you have an unsustainable, I think Bob is on to something, like on all fronts, you have a very unsustainable business model and I don't know if that's government ops that looks at your structure, but um, I, I was just thinking about um, the forfeiture bill that we were talking about the other day and how um, in certain cases we, and people in this room know that I really have this thing about towers being able to get people's cars. So in some cases we are allowing people to take people's money um, same thing with like child support. So I'm, I'm not saying we should open the floodgates and do that here, but it's just, again, like quite a tale of two different ways that um, we're not really helping victims. And that's not your fault. I feel like you're doing everything you can. But I'm really concerned about the structural setup of your of your office like it, it feels like as hard as it is for any of the state offices you're like you've got like a mountain to climb to get you know something so i'd love to figure out who is that government ops maxine because it is yeah i think i think it is and and we can we can just you know continue with discussion um you know at another time we're offline but i think it really is is government operations and right now we're focusing on h87 and how restitution um comes yes. does or doesn't come into play but but no and and at some point we'll have the discussion about 
use of fees and fines to to fund, you know. Right, uh, because yeah. it would seem that they would need at least some grant that sort of buffers your your you know your bad payments. And I'd love it if there's another state that is you know set up in a different way that we should be looking at because this is really like ugh, you know not right. a good model. Right. So, right. So, yep. Yeah. yeah, and we're going to yeah. talk about that on Thursday too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. And Martin, you get the you get the last word. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple questions uh, and kind of focus on on some of the property crimes that we're looking at in H87. So uh, you talked a little bit about businesses and small businesses. Uh, the courts uh, the courts still order restitution. You, you don't have anything to do with the actual ordering of whether there's an order for restitution or not, right? No. And I guess the question is since your organization has the ability to collect through wage garnishment, I think is one of the things you mentioned through lottery winnings through probably I assume tax returns as well. Yep. I mean, are those things available to businesses and how would they be if they don't have an entity like, like yours to be able to provide that collection component or uh, so? We, we still collect for them. Okay. All right. We no, collect that, well, for businesses. Okay. It's right. just that we don't advance them money. Gotcha. All right. That that's great. Thank you. And and, and how often do you use wage garnishment to to collect? It, we're the last one on the list, so we don't. That's not usually a place we go because child support is the number one piece that they're taking off, and right. and so it it really it's mostly surprisingly enough lottery winnings, unclaimed property, and tax re returns. Right, and and you only can take so much from a wage garnishment. There's a yeah. like a cap or or a floor, I should say, on that. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. Um, I think that was all the questions. I, I thought I had one more, but that I think that's my main questions. Thanks. Great, and I have a written testimony that I'll send to you all that talks about all of this. Great. Thank great. you, Maxine. Well, thank, thank you, and we certainly can um, can get back to this at. At another time, I do, like I said, just want to keep the schedule because um, other folks have, have meetings um, coming up very soon and it's been a long day. So thank you. And Robin, I'm sorry we didn't get to you, but we will definitely see you again uh, when we take this bill bill up again. Okay. So, yep. um, so Barbara, is your hand still up or is that from before? Okay. All right. So, um, so committee, we did obviously did not get to our budget discussion, but we'll do that uh, with Barbara tomorrow afternoon. And any questions before we uh, go off YouTube and adjourn? Just procedural questions or anything like that? Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much then.